who's the guy up on the stage? I'll give you a quick background of myself. Um, I'm basically uh, a beach kid. Grew up on the beaches in Florida, where I had really no awareness of the outside world at all. Um, I knew surf breaks up and down the coast, but I had no idea what it was like in any other state, any other country. Uh, I had no idea what kind of issues were going on in the world. And I don't claim to now, by the way. Um, and then I had a moment of awareness when someone introduced me to computers and Photoshop, and within a few days, uh, I found myself in New England with my first digital design job. I interviewed over the phone. My employer thought I was in Boston. So uh, quickly, I made my way to Boston, learned a few things, moved up some corporate ladders, figured out how to um, well, actually, I wrote a research paper at Northeastern University called Interactive Television. That introduced me to the internet. And uh, basically, I've been using the internet since then to sustain myself economically. So my next big awareness shift happened uh, when I caught a plane, a United flight out of Logan Airport on September 10, 2001, landed here. My first visuals here were on the television of uh, a plane hitting the second World Trade Center. So that was a very uh, tranquil day. Time seemed to kind of stand still in Keokaha, where I was staying. And I was introduced to the island in a uh, sort of a unique way. I'd been here before, but I'd never experienced uh, the, the quiet as it was on, on that day in the following week. And so, fast forward a few years, uh, scraped enough money together to buy some property. Uh, had I known, looking back, I'm not sure I ever would have done this again, but I moved into a remote rainforest in Mountain View next to Uo, and built a tree house. That's all the money that we had, was enough money left over for a tree house after the, the property. And to really avoid having to go to the water spigot all the time, and to avoid having to go to the store all the time, I started building some systems that help uh, reduce those trips to the store. So uh, I learned to catch rainwater, learned to coax energy from a small uh, Honda EU 2000 generator, and store that energy in batteries. I learned to do DC wiring. Uh, you know the rest of the story. Uh, about that same time, I got my third awareness shift where I realized that if I could do that, anyone could. And what we were doing by saving money was actually learning how to live in harmony with the environment. Uh, we didn't have money for a D9. Uh, we had money for a chainsaw, uh, which we used very sparingly. I think I, knocked, I, think I cut down two trees to make a, an area to pull some cars into, uh, and I bought a weed whacker. So with that, I forced the trail, went back, built the treehouse. And I realized that not only could anyone do that, but when you do do that, when you do move into the forest and the forest is all around you, you do affect the forest and you have tremendous impact even when you're living lightly, but everything that you put into the forest comes back to you. And that part is a little more difficult to explain and, and I won't even I won't even try in this type of a forum. But basically it's been very rewarding. And I realized that then I had to teach others how to, to do the same thing. So that's what I uh, that's what I started doing. Uh, this is a sketch of the treehouse and go one more. And so uh, I co-founded this nonprofit, Green Collar Technologies, with uh, a vision of sustainability and abundance on Hawaii Island. Very simple vision. Um, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, I'm a latecomer to the, the party, right? I, I've been doing this for a few years. Other people have been doing it since the 60s, since we got that famous photograph back from space where we could see the planet all in one shot and everyone realized, oh my God, we're all right there. We're gonna have to start taking care of the place. And so 
What I'm going to tell you is, is really nothing new along those lines. Again, I'm a, I'm a latecomer, I'm just joining the path uh, in recent years. Yes. Um, so with that vision, then I thought, well, you know, how do, how do we execute a vision? How, how, do you, how do you make that happen? I, if it were on the internet, I can make it happen. But how, how do you move into a place and then convince uh, elders in that place that um, they could improve it the way they're doing it when they've already been living there for hundreds if not thousands of years successfully. Uh, I still don't know how to do that, but I came up with some missions to, to try and accomplish those goals. One of which, um, back here, one, sorry, um, was to educate green power workers. So in 2006, 2007, I started studying what other people were doing. I started studying legislation at the federal level. Uh, there was a guy, Van Jones, you might have heard of him, he wrote a book, uh, The Green Power Economy, uh, and was, uh, uh, he's not around anymore. Uh, but that mission to educate green power workers, I thought, would, would pave the way for success, right? We teach people how to collect their own rainwater, we teach people how to do some DC, some highly efficient wiring. We teach people how to install solar panels, and, and maybe that's the key. So we spurred this local green jobs movement following in the footsteps of others. And we wrote an application for a federal grant for uh, $4 million, uh, relying on support from uh, some key players in local government. The application was never submitted. Uh, but we did extensive research, or I did extensive research into what it would take to deliver this type of education. We created a series of classes, the Sustainable Living Educational Series. Uh, started off as four classes. Uh, we later were able to do five classes with help from the county, um, and we were able to reduce the price of those classes from $50 per class to $5 per class, which was great. Filled the classes up, we raised a lot of awareness in 2008. Uh, we taught classes all over the island, and we continue to do that. Uh, we uh, co-wrote the Hawaii Island Green Economy Report, now in its final draft. You can download a copy of that at hcrc.info. That's what it looks like. And then ultimately, this seemed to be working really well. When, when I realized that we needed to teach the classes, I realized that I was no expert in any of these subjects myself. And even though I had built systems and I knew how to build systems, there were people on the island already that knew how to do these things way, way better than I did. So nervously, I called uh, one of the experts in the field. Uh, I believe the first person was Trisha McCumber from UH, uh, who wrote the guide on rainwater harvesting. And she said, sure. And so I realized we were onto something. And since then, we've been able to get lots of local experts. We're still inviting lots of local experts to do this. Um, my point there is that we actually had an abundance of people that were willing to, to talk about the subject. So we put together the Hawaii Island Sustainability Forum, and we do that on the original Earth Day each year, March 20th. Um, we've done two. March 20th of 2011 will be our third one. That's the background. So, now we'll take a look at the foreground. So what's going on right now? We're, after two years, two and a half years, maybe three of, of raising awareness and just letting folks know uh, what the situation was after doing research and, and talking with county planners and, and officials in government, we realized there's some pretty serious issues that we needed to, to deal with and that's part of the foreground. Uh, one is energy independence. So, uh, on the mainland and the rest of the developed world, uh, they're relying on fossil fuels uh, at the tune of 80% of their energy needs. Here it's 90%. Not too bad, right? Uh, we're under different threats though because of our location, because of our dislocation uh, from the mainland. So, uh, when we rely on those fuels, 
uh, it's a little different situation for us. And we also uh, pay the highest prices, you know the story there. Um, and we determined uh, through uh, this research that this was, uh, this reliance was unsustainable. And then as awareness grew, as uh, folks started to plan for this, they came out with uh, clean energy portfolios. Uh, HECO, uh, HELCO was one of the, the first to kind of jump on this and, and work with the state to develop uh, these standards. So here's the plan. By uh, 2010, we should be at 15%, and that means 15% renewable energy. So on Hawaii Island, we're already at about 35%. Uh, does anyone know where we're at with this? Right. Yeah, no one knows. Uh, and by 2015, we should be, uh, I'm sorry, 2015, 15%, 20% 20 by 2020. Uh, the, the challenge here that I see is the goals aren't measurable. So we don't have, um, we have a large system that doesn't measure itself on a daily or monthly basis. Uh, they'll go around and, and collect the information as they can and then share the information in annual reports or biannual reports. This is tradition. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll be getting a report soon on, on where we're at through the rest of the state. Uh, back one more. This is important to note. Um, these percentages, this, is, this isn't law, this isn't legislation. This is an idea put together by uh, HECO and the state. So <clears throat> when it's not legislation, it means it's not a binding law. So these percentages can be revised at any time by an independent panel. And I would encourage everyone, uh, my slides will be available, uh, uh, well, they're available online right now, but I would encourage everyone to go to this web address down below and see who these local experts are uh, that have the ability to revise these plans because we're, those plans are going to be revised. Isn't it the Public Utilities Commission too that really authorizes it? Uh, the, the Public Utilities Commission uh, negotiates purchase power agreements. Yeah. So through 2016, we're in a purchase power agreement with the Geothermal, for example. Uh, so we won't see any change in that until 2016 when those contracts are negotiated. But this is an independent panel that can make a call, a judgment call, and say that uh, those numbers are too high. Uh, and, and again, I encourage you to go and, and look at uh, the Our People page of these panels that uh, are going to be making those decisions. So my question is, what role will education play? Obviously, we, we raise awareness. Um, how many how many folks in here under 18 years of age? 25. Okay. All right. Uh, next slide. Uh, food independence. So obvious challenge again. Um, now this one's interesting. So there's, uh, and I'll break this down for you. Uh, we have a Hawaii County Agricultural Plan, and if you're familiar with that plan, uh, you know that we're trying to increase uh, food production locally to 30 percent. Right now we're at 90 percent, 95 percent. We're trying to increase that to 70 percent. Um, so thereby producing 30% of our food locally in 10 years. Um, and that's after learning that over the previous 10 years, we were actually eating more food than we were growing. So we were at risk of going from 90 to 95% and, and higher at a much faster rate. The economy has helped with that because we have less people on the island right now. Uh, some of the short-term goals in the ACT plan include uh, this 30% that I mentioned and removing existing impediments that are currently preventing us from growing food. That's good. Uh, protecting our food and our, our the, the things that we can eat from invasive species. And uh, there'll be support and uh, advocacy for education that will 
help everyone understand the problem.